In a way, I brought you here to offer you a job. A job? What job? My job. You think you can do it better, so here's your chance. When you leave this building, you will be endowed with all my powers. Whatever you say, Bill. Come. Take a closer walk with me. Let me explain the rules. Rules? Yeah, you left in such a rush, I didn't get a chance to explain. Two extra fingers freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> I just figured I'd get your attention. <laughs> I did the same thing to Gandhi. He didn't eat for three weeks. <laughs> anyway, here's the deal. You have all my powers. Use them any way you choose. There are only two rules. You can't tell anybody you're God. Believe me, you don't want that kind of attention. And you can't mess with free will. Uh-huh. Can I ask why? Yes, you can. That's the beauty of it. This is amazing. Oh, speaking of amazing, excuse me. Holy sh... cow. Since you're through with these, I think I'll keep them. Might come in handy someday. See you around, kid. Where are you going? I'm taking a vacation. God doesn't take vacations, does he? Do ye? Do you ever hear of the Dark Ages? Besides, I'm covered. You can clear everything up in five minutes if you want to, right? Ciao. So what would you do? What would you do if you had God's power? How would you use God's power? How would you live with such power? If you've seen the movie Bruce Almighty, then you know that he uses it for selfish gain, to live lavishly, even to sabotage a coworker who was promoted over him. But what would you do? You see, I think before we truly ponder that question, before we can answer that question, we should ask, well, how does God use? How does God reveal God's own power? You see, that's what we're talking about today as we continue in this four-week sermon series, God Revealed, a series about the ways in which God relates to us, how we believe, how we imagine God relates to us as we use metaphors for God. Metaphors that Carolyn Bowler lifts up in her book that we are using throughout the series. God the what, she says, what are metaphors for God reveal about our beliefs in God? Yes, last week we talked about metaphors and how they are useful and actually needed in our understanding and visualizing God. Well, last week we saw that God's nature is ultimately revealed through Jesus Christ. Well, once again, we turn to the book of Ephesians, and we see that God's power is at work in Jesus Christ and also in us. We look at chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see what is the hope of God's call, what is the richness of God's glorious inheritance among believers, and what is the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers. That power is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at God's right side in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church, which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. And it's through this word, through this passage, we see how God's power is revealed. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place and in our lives. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will remain in a mighty way as your word is given and received. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will have enough light to see. 
Yes, after, after opening the book, giving praise unto God for those spiritual blessings and promises that we have in Christ, now Paul closes chapter 1 in hope and in prayer, praying that the Ephesians would have the appropriate eyes of the heart. Yes, that they would have the necessary vision and the insight to see the truth, to see namely three things. One, the hope of God's call. Two, the richness of God's glorious inheritance. And three, what we focus on today, the overwhelming greatness of God's power that is working among us believers. Yes, Paul wants the Ephesians, wants us this morning, wants us to grow, to mature, to progress in our faith so that we're able to see and appreciate the significance of God's power at work in us. And this power isn't power that's, that's gained politically or, or economically. It's not even the type of power associated with a meaningful, dramatic conversion experience. No, instead, according to verse 17, it's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit, and revel- re- spirit of wisdom and revelation that comes as we progress in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's just a gradual revealing of God's self, God's God's truth, God's promises, God's kingdom, and God's world, a gradual understanding that would otherwise be impossible for us to understand and to grasp. But take notice that this overwhelmingly great power is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And remember, Jesus was actually dead. It wasn't that he was just in a deep sleep or unconscious or in a coma. He was actually dead. Well, in John 10, 18, Jesus says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Well, he says that in John, here in Ephesians, it actually says when God raised Christ, instead of he rose or that he took it up on his own. So here in Ephesians, it emphasizes a mystery beyond uh, simply resuscitating or reviving or reanimating a, a corpse, a dead body. No, here Jesus is pulled out of death. His, his humanity is taken up into God's eternal purposes in a spiritual body. And that's remarkable in itself. That is some power. We well, see, Paul doesn't stop there. No, here in Ephesians, God's power is revealed in both Jesus' resurrection and also his exaltation. It says God raised him from the dead and set him at God's right side in the heavens. Well, of course, Jesus ascending and then sitting at God's right side doesn't get as much attention or fanfare as his birth at Christmas or his death on Good Friday or his resurrection on Easter Sunday. But the ascension is still essential to the entire story. Yes, it brings closure to his birth and ministry, to his death and resurrection. But it also opens the door for what's next. You see, it's necessary for the story and the work of Christ to continue through the apostles. Rowan Williams, Archbishop of Canterbury, explains it like this. He says, imagine when you wake up first thing in the morning... When you turn on the light or someone cruelly turns it on for you, he says you're only conscious of the bright light itself. And only gradually do your eyes adjust sufficiently to the light that you're able to make out other things other than the light. He says after a few moments, you cease to be conscious of the light itself and start to see everything else in the room that is now illumined by the light. Well, the gospel accounts of Jesus' resurrection is similar. Yes, his resurrection shows uh, shows itself almost as that initial bright morning light. Yes, at first his resurrection was so blinding to the disciples that they could only uh, concentrate. They were only focused. They were only conscious of him. Well, the ascension, you see, is that moment in which the light begins to recede to the background so that Jesus becomes the one in which we see everything else through. He says, he is the light we see by. We see the world in a new way because he, we see it through him, see it with his eyes. 
You see, Jesus ascending and then sitting was essential for the apostles to see properly and to continue the work of Christ. And it's essential for us this morning, for us to have enough light to see God's power at work in the world and at work in our own lives. And so it's important that, yes, we take time with Christ so that we progress in our relationship with Christ so that we end up seeing the world through the eyes of Christ. So what about you? Are you waking up, tapping into your relationship with Christ, into that power? Yes, are you seeing through the light of Christ every day? And are you allowing yourself to see God's power at work, a power revealing itself in our everyday lives? You see, when we wake up to new mercies every single morning and we see the light of the sun and actually see everything else because of the sun light, Let it remind you that there is a light that shines brighter and fuller from the one that, yes, was raised, from the one that was ascended, from the one that now sits beyond creation, beyond the skies and beyond the heavens, the one that sits far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named now, not only now, but in the future. You see, here we're told, we're even, we're even assured that there is nothing within all of creation more powerful than Jesus Christ, that there's nothing capable of ultimately preventing God's purposes. Instead, we see that Christ is far above, that Christ is the highest, the most high. We're talking about the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the most powerful among any and all powers. Amen? Well, you see, that's good news. That's good news because if we keep reading in Ephesians, we get to chapter 6, verse 12. It says, we fight against rulers and authorities, forces of cosmic darkness and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Well, who knows how these spiritual powers of evil, who knows how and what they may affect. But we do know that there are some powers of evil that cause pain and tragedy and suffering. Again, this is good news because Christ is far above. Christ is far above any spiritual powers of evil. But I want you to know this morning that far above doesn't mean far off. Amen? But, but, since we can see, even experience, endure so much pain and suffering and tragedy, we're prone to ask, well, then why? Why, if Christ is so far above then why do we see so much pain? Why, if God is good and God all-powerful, do we suffer? So that leads us to then ask, well, how is God powerful? How does God use such power? In the book, Carolyn says, the conversation about what kind of power God has and therefore what we can expect from God is a question that fills classrooms and churches and synagogues and mosques. However, when we experience a difficult crisis, the question becomes intensely personal. What can God do for me? You see, Carolyn talks about being in an earthquake and how traumatic it was in the moment, but also for the days, weeks, and months afterwards. Whereas Floridians, we know what it's like to be in storms, thunderstorms, tropical storms, and of course, hurricanes, maybe even tornadoes. I'm sure some of you have faced many storms in your life. Whether natural storms, relational storms, or tragic circumstantial storms. Carolyn talks about the storm that her and her husband went through as they lost one of their sons. The emotional toll it had on the two of them. And then how, of course, it impacted her perspective of God and the metaphor she uses for God. I know some of you can relate this morning. You can relate because you too have faced loss in your life. Loss of time. Loss of dreams, loss of financial security, loss of health, loss of relationships, loss of marriages, and yes, loss of loved ones. Almost two months ago, or over two months ago, I was getting ready for um, annual conference the first week of June, and that Monday, I was spending time with my covenant group as we have a retreat the two days before conference every single year. That Monday morning, I woke up to a phone call that One of my friends uh, named Dane, he and I uh, went through college together. We were, we pledged the same fraternity. We were pledged brothers along with a third. Well, I married he and his wife, Shannon, three years ago. 
Well, the two of them, along with their 18-month-old daughter, Adeline, was out for a family bike ride that Sunday evening and was hit by an impaired driver who jumped the curb. The 18-month-old daughter died. Dane's been unconscious in a coma in ICU ever since. Shannon um, shattered her leg and has, has had some surgeries, but of course, her whole life has been shattered, her whole being, her heart has been shattered. It leads all of us around them to say, well, why? If God is far above, if God is all-powerful, if God is good, then why would such a thing happen? Well, what's happened in your life? What have you endured that causes you to ask, why? What can God now do for me? Carolyn says, there are many ways to envision God's power, and the metaphors we use with which we are, are comfortable often suggest what we think about God's power. When, when we see what the metaphors we use actually suggest about God's power, sometimes we realize we need a different metaphor. She goes on to list some of these. One of the metaphors for God that we are most familiar with is God Almighty, God being all-powerful. Well, for some folks, God Almighty actually equates to or implies a magic wand God, she says. That God can simply wave a magic wand and stop an earthquake, stop a hurricane, stop an impaired driver, or stop fill in the blank. Well, this kind of God is similar to a genie God, one that we can simply rub a vase or rub our hands together in prayer and expect that whatever we desire, it will happen. We see the problem with this image of God comes when tragedy comes. Because then we're left with the questions, well, why did God allow this to happen? Or worse, why did God cause this to happen? And of course, when is God going to fix what happened? Amen? We see, I want you to believe. I believe in God Almighty. I believe in a supreme being, the one that had enough power to speak everything that exists into being. But it leads me to still ask, well, how is God powerful today? How does God use power? She mentions two more images, both in which God... Uh, restrains God's self. The first is God the CEO. Here the thought is that the CEO, of course, of an organization or business delegates authority and responsibility. That everyone in the business, though, knows that the CEO could take charge at any time. And in a crisis, the employees may want the CEO to, but perhaps she chooses not to, to simply stand by and empower others. Well, here, while God could intervene, God usually does not for whatever reason. You see, God, the tough parent, is similar, but just a different setting, a family setting. That's the image some people have of God. Well, she goes on to list some others, but I want to lift up my three favorite. The first is God as persistent life. She tells a quick story about her daughter who received the school project to catch some caterpillars. They caught two, put them in mason jars. One went to school, one stayed at home. Eventually, the caterpillar found itself in a cocoon. Well, after a couple of months, the teacher threw the one in the classroom away. She says they forgot about the one at home, but then lo and behold, on the first day of spring, burst the butterfly. Yes, here, God, the persistent life, uses God's resurrection power, uses power in every event, even deadly, even tragic ones, to urge the best possibility to be born. Yes, here God works relentlessly to transform us, enable us to hold on and to carry on to life. It's, those, it's like we live into the, the hymn, life is worth living just because he lives. And then, as a musician, one of my other favorites, God, the jazz band leader. Here, God's power is persuasive and it's shared. She says, it's realistically, it realistically invokes the experience of human freedom with our power and responsibility, while also presenting God with enormous creative and persuasive power and responsibility. Yes, here, God guides each individual member while simultaneously guiding the group as a whole. Well, here we also have some freedom, freedom given to us by the leader and also by the jazz music itself. Yes, here God delights in us 
being creative, us imagining, us improvising, using our talents. I mean, as a percussionist, amen for the drum solo. Right, Craig? Where were you at? Right, Craig? Amen for the drum solo. Yes, here, the jazz band leader, together we are led with God. We work with God to make beautiful, harmonious, soul-lifting music. And then my most favorite image of God, God is dynamic love. Yes, here we recognize, of course, that life is filled with risk and uncertainty, but that God still has the power of love, and that God continues to show us love tenderly, patiently, always and forever. She says, for me, it is enough for God to be and to have the power of dynamic love. Yes, instead of some physical force or course of force, she says, I find it more helpful to consider God's power as consistent, dependable, sufficient love. Last week, I had the honor to co-officiate um, Adeline's service, the 18-month-old, alongside a friend, Reverend Shelley Denmark. You see, she was the one that would have baptized Adeline back in January. Well, at the beginning of the service, I stood up front to cue the pianist and to have the congregation rise while Shelly processed in with Shannon, who is on a walker. She still cannot walk along with Shannon and the family. Well, you see, in that moment, I had this emotional image. At the end of the service, um, Shannon had chosen the benediction, the congregational benediction to be 1 Corinthians 13. That's inscribed on her and Dane's wedding band, but it's also what was recited at their wedding. It's often, as you know, called the love chapter. Well, Shelly and I decided that I would lead that because since I married them, I was the one that would have read those words at the wedding. Well, you see, at the end of the service, right before I introduced the benediction, I said, you know, three years ago, I had the opportunity to stand in this spot next to Dane in the wedding party and to see you come down the aisle. Well, today, it was a very different image seeing you come down the aisle, as I know you were filled with very different feelings and emotions. But I told her and I told them that that same power, that same presence, that same God of dynamic love that's filled her heart, that filled that day on her wedding day, that filled it with joy, is now the same power, the same presence, the same God of dynamic love that fills her, that is comforting her, that is supporting her, and enabling her to walk down this aisle. Amen? Yes, that this God, I want you to know, Pasadena, this God of loving power and of powerful love is with you, is with us on the best of our days and the worst of our days. Far above. Far above does not mean far off. So again, how does God work in times like this? I want you to know, Pastor Daniel, it's usually quite often through us. She says our names for God affect not only how we relate to God, but also how we relate to each other. We tend to emulate the kind of power we assume God to have. Maybe we need to consider God's power as shared power and persuasive love and to model those qualities in our behaviors. Yes, what if we use those three? The power of persistent love, the power of the jazz band leader, the power of dynamic love. You see, for Shannon, it would be God's power working in and through the congregation, that band of people, her family and friends, through their dynamic love and care and support to comfort, strengthen, and transform her, to enable her to hold on and to carry on to life. Yes, most often God is working his power, God's power through us. His body, as Paul says, the church. The church who is the fullness of Christ, the one who fills everything and in every way. You see, the word that becomes fills here is from pleroma, and it means filled, an activity of feeling. It also means that which is filled with the presence and power of Christ. Yes, we are filled with the power and presence of Christ, but I want you to know that that word also means fulfilling, fulfilling. So the more that we are filled with the power and presence of Christ, we are called to then live into our calling to fulfill or fill the world with God's power and presence. Only then do we fulfill our calling as the body of Christ. Remember, a part of this series is about us recognizing that God is all around us. 
trying to get our attention, trying to relate to us and then through us to the rest of the world. But in order for that to happen, we have to have, as Paul says, as Paul prayed, those eyes of the heart to see the world through the eyes of Christ, to make us more aware on a daily basis the needs around us. Quick story to show you what I mean. We were at the beach, and I was putting up our 12 by 12 tent. I need 144 square feet of shade. Uh, I'm done tanning. (laughs) As I'm putting up the tent, I noticed that there was a car that was stuck in the sand. And at this point, like two others went over to try to help to no avail. And then eventually I I put the tent down and I and somebody else, we walked over as well. So you had the, the driver in the driver's seat and then you had the four of us on the back bumper and on the count of three, one, two, three, we lifted up the back of the car Step forward just a little bit so the tires could catch some traction and then free itself, free the car from being stuck. Well, you see, one person couldn't do it. The first three couldn't do it. It took five of us. It took all of our commitment. It took shared power. You see, that's what we're talking about, folks. We are the church. And so we have this power, Paul is saying, to see those that are, in, that are stuck, those that are in need. And so as we say in our baptism of vows, we must use the power and freedom that God gives us to pull others, not simply out of sand, but out of life's circumstances, the turmoil, the hardships, the brokenness, the tragedy, the heartbrokenness. And you know what? We use the same power that raised Jesus Christ, not just not just out of a grave, but pull Jesus out of death. So what are you going to do with such power? It is not that God is just letting us, she says, have this power, but that God cannot be other than how God is. God is persuasive and loving, providing wisdom patiently, persistently, and powerfully. God has no ultimate hammer up God's sleeve. We simply need to get on with our carrying with the power that we humans do have, knowing God is helping us along the way. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song, Amazing Grace to the Glory of God.